This is uh, the first in a uh, new series called the Theoretically Speaking series, uh, produced by the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing with sponsorship from MSRI and Berkeley City College. We hope that there'll be several more in the future. Um, we've had some talks in the past that attempt to introduce a broad audience to theoretical concepts about computing. We, we had a speaker on the famous P versus NP problem about a year ago. Uh, before that, we had a meeting with uh, Alan Turing's biographer, and we've had other sessions sponsored with MSRI, and we hope to do, have more of them in the future. And tonight, uh, we're very happy to have um, Dan Bonet as our uh, speaker. Uh, Dan received his PhD from Princeton in 1996. He's currently a professor at Stanford, where he holds the Rajiv Matwani Chair in Computer Science. Uh, Dan has taught three massive online courses through the uh, Coursera platform, uh, courses on security and cryptography. He's received more awards than I can remember offhand, so I had to write them all down. Packard, Sloan, Terman, RSA, and Girdle Prize. Um, most recently, the very prestigious Infosys Foundation Award. He's an expert on encryption and cryptanalysis. Uh, he is known for innovations uh, such as identity-based encryption and pairing-based encryption. Perhaps you'll learn something about those during the talk. And the title of the talk is Cryptography, From Mathematical Magic to Secure Communication. So, thank you, Dick, for the kind of introduction. I'm really excited to be here. I love uh, talks to the public. Uh, I think it's really important to expose the work that's happening in theoretical computer science to the public, so thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Everything I say here should be clear to everyone, and I'm really happy to see some kids in the audience, so if there's anything I say that's not clear, please raise your hand and, and, and ask a question. If it's not clear to you, it's probably not clear to, to others as well. So in coming to speak here, I was kind of one, debating what topic to uh, present to you. There are lots and lots of stories in crypto that I could, I could talk about. It's an amazing field that's kind of at the intersection of um, theory and practice. And so I chose one particular story that I just love to tell, and I hope you'll enjoy it too. So the story I want to tell you about is a story about how something that was developed really for no reason other than intellectual curiosity and how that thing has actually become extremely practical and you are using it today every time you use the internet. So that's what I'd like to tell you about. But our story actually begins a long time ago. Our story begins actually 1800 years ago uh, with a guy named Diophantus. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. Have heard of him. He lived uh, in the, between 200 and 300 AD. There's not a whole lot actually that we know about Diophantus. All we know is that he lived in Alexandria and he um, wrote a bunch of books that I'll talk about in just a minute. What he was interested in was this question of uh, what we call rational points on curves. Now, why was he interested in this? We have no idea. But he was interested in this problem. And so let me tell you a little bit about what he did. But before I do that, let me just explain what I mean by rational points on curves. So first of all, I'm sure you all know what a rational number is. So like a half, 13 over 8 are all rational numbers. Basically, the, the ratio of two integers is a rational number. But for example, square root of 2 is not a rational number. And what is a rational point? Well, a rational point is a point x, y, where both coordinates are rational. Now, what do I mean by um, rational points on curves? In fact, kind of the first problem in his book is one that he kind of just presents and discounts very quickly, is he asks the simple question of, what are the rational points in the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1? Now, probably many of you recognize this equation. This is just an equation for a circle. And the question he's asking is basically, what are the rational points in a circle? So there are very easy rational points that you can point out. In fact, here are four of them, right? Basically the 0, 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, and um, 0, minus 1. But the question is, are there any other rational points on the circle? And I'm sure, again, with just a few seconds of thought, you'll see that, for example, the point 4 fifth, 3 fifth is also a rational point in the circle. And in fact, you might recognize a Pythagorean, tri a triangle, a Pythagorean triple there, 3, 4, 5, 
And that's actually the reason why this, uh, these, this particular uh, rational point is on the circle. And in fact, he was just saying very quickly that uh, take any rational number s, so s is any rational number, you can map it to this point. You can see that if s is rational, then these two fractions are also going to be rational numbers. And that will actually give you a point on the circle. And in fact, any such, um, any, yeah, so in fact, all points in the circle, all rational points in the circle can be obtained in this particular way. Yeah? So just very simple algebra will show you that for any rational point, this is in fact a point on the circle. These days, this is not an interesting observation to us because all this says is that if you think of the rationals as sort of a line, then all this says is that the, 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 the set of rationals on a line essentially map to the circle. So the, the circle, in some sense, is kind of equivalent to a line as far as rational points are concerned. So that's fine. Not interesting to us these days. Even for him, this was kind of trivial. But then he went ahead and generalized and asked the question of a lot, asked a similar question about lots of other curves. So here you have an ellipse and a hyperbola. And he was asking, can we find rational points on all those curves? And in fact, he wrote lots and lots of books on this question, not just on this question, but on many other questions in kind of basic algebra. So he wrote the famous 13 books of arithmet Arithmetica. These were stored in the Library of Alexandria. Unfortunately, only six of them survived. The story there is kind of interesting in that um, you probably all, what happened to the Library of, of Alexand Alexandria? Burned down. Well, it was burned down, destroyed. In the fourth century AD, it was basically destroyed or shut down. And many of the books that he wrote were actually lost forever which is kind of unfortunate. I can almost imagine as it's being destroyed, people kind of just you know, pulling in the books, the most important books out of, out of the library. Like four of his books apparently made it to the Vatican. So someone just grabbed four of his books, put it on a, on a boat, and shipped it over to the Vatican. Um, in the Vatican library, interestingly, it just laid there for 1,000 years until someone finally, tra in, in the 1500s, someone finally translated his books to, la to uh, Latin. The, one of his books made it uh, to the famous Fermat. And that was the birth of kind of what we now call classical number theory. So uh, one way to think about the destruction of the knowledge of the Library of Alexandria, basically when the library was destroyed, all the knowledge of antiquity, including half of his books, basically were lost. So one way to think about the destruction of the Library of Alexandria is if it hadn't been destroyed, today we actually might be a thousand years more advanced than we really are. Yeah? It actually raises interesting questions about the preservation of knowledge. I hope this will inspire some of you to think about the preservation of the knowledge that we generate, especially the knowledge that we, generate, we have generated in the last 20 or 30 years. Most of it is stored in digital form, and if our civilization happens to collapse, most of it will be destroyed as well. So it's actually quite an interesting question of how do we preserve the knowledge that we generate and store in digital form. You can see the damage that's caused when knowledge is, is destroyed. But anyhow, going back to our story, when you look at, these, uh, at this, this type of problems that Diophantus was looking at today, these are not interesting problems. We basically know very general and very simple solutions to these questions on, of rational points on, on, on ellipses, rational points on hyperbolas. All these are very, very simple questions to us. They're just not something that we're, we're interested in. However, however, if you look all of a sudden at one of his problems, something new pops up. Yeah, one of his problems, all of a sudden in book number four, problem 24, looks different from everything else that he's done. And what he's asking for is basically, can you find rational points on this particular curve? y squared equals x cubed minus x plus 9. Now, of course, Diophantos didn't, say, didn't state it in this, in this language. But when you translate what the, what the, the question that he was asking, it basically translates to this exact uh, question that I say here. Just find rational points on this curve. So can someone, suggest a, can someone point out some rational points on this curve? Give me one rational point on the curve. What, what? One three. one, three. Excellent. If you plug in x equals 1, you get 9 on the left-hand side. And if you plug in y equals 3, you also get 9. So 1, 3 is one example rational point. In fact, there are a couple of other rational points like this. In fact, there are six integral points. Integral means that both coordinates are integers. So here I just wrote uh, the six simple integral points. So 1, 3, 1 minus 3, 0, 3, 0 minus 3, and so on. And the natural question that he asked, so of course, he knew of these six points. And the, the natural question he asks is, what are the other, are there any other rational points on this particular curve? How would we might, how would we might uh, go about constructing other rational points on this curve? And so it turns out this question actually is quite deep, yes? And it, in fact, today, we, we, we tend to generalize it to what's called an elliptic curve. 
Okay, so let me explain what an elliptic curve is. In fact, what Diophantus looked at was a very, very special case of an elliptic curve. So what is an elliptic curve? An elliptic curve basically is exactly the same equation that Diophantus looked at, y squared equals x cubed, but instead of having uh, the constants be fixed, we let the constants a and b be arbitrary. Yeah, so a and b are gonna be some rational numbers. And uh, you know, as you can see, basically Diophantus' curve, oh, I'm sorry, so we let the, 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 the constants a and b be arbitrary rational numbers, subject to some ridiculous, some, some you know, technical constraints that I'm not gonna talk about too much here. I'll say that if this constraint is, vi is violated, so if this quantity happens to be zero, again, this degenerates to a non-interesting problem. So we're only looking at the case where this quantity is not equal to zero. And in fact, if you look at Diophantus' curve, of course, that's a special case where A is equal to negative one and B is equal to nine. Now, you can draw what this curve looks like and it's this bizarre kind of looking shape. That's what the curve looks like. And again, you wonder why does he care about finding it, it, rational points on this curve? I have no idea. Yeah, why was he interested in this problem? We don't know. He just happened to be interested in this particular problem. When you think about this curve, you realize, first of all, it's symmetric against the, across the x axis because, of, because y is being squared. In other, word, in other words, if xy is a solution, then x minus y is also gonna be a solution, and that's why you get this nice um, reflection across the x axis. Okay, so here we can even draw the, the six rational points that you already told me, right? These were simple six rational points, and we were asking the question, are there other rational points on this curve? Before we go on, I just wanna point out the name elliptic curves has nothing to do or very little to do with ellipses. And in fact, there's a very nice article that I wrote down here. You're gonna have the slide so you can look up these references later if you're interested. There's a very nice and accessible article called Why Ellipses Are Not Elliptic Curves uh, from 2012 um, that explains why these things are actually not ellipses. The name uh, is historic. Why it's called an ellipse, I'm not gonna explain. Why it's called an elliptic curve, I'm not gonna explain here. There's a very vague and distant connection, but these are not ellipses. As you can see, this is not an ellipse, and for a very deep reason as well. Okay, so, so far so good. So that's the problem that he was interested in. And what he made was really kind of an amazing observation. Think about this, 1800 years ago, he made the following observation. So here's the observation that he made. He said the following. So we have our, our elliptic curve, yes, so the particular curve that he was interested in. And he already knows six points on this curve. So here, let me draw two of the points, P and Q. And the observation that he made is the following. Well, if we have two points on this curve, well, what's the most natural thing for us to do? What do you do with two points? Well, if you have two points, you wanna draw a line through them. Yes, so here, let's, let's, let's draw a line through them. And the fact is that when you draw a line through this curve, it must intersect the curve at one more point, with exactly one more point. So why does that happen? So here, it's gonna intersect the curve at one more point R, the reason the line has to intersect the curve at three points is because of this three here. This is a cubic curve, degree three, and it must intersect, therefore a line must intersect the curve at three points. Okay, so we get this other point R, and then the observation that he made is in fact that if P and Q are themselves rational points, like the six points that we started with, it turns out the third intersection point must also be rational. And in fact, this is a very, very easy fact to prove you can take it as a homework exercise if you like. Yeah, it basically follows from the fact that if you have a, po a cubic polynomial, a rational cubic polynomial that has two rational roots, the third root must also be rational. Very simple fact. Okay, so fine. So now, what does this mean? It means that if we have two rational points, we can build another third rational point. So this made him very happy because now if you plug in the points P and Q and you just solve, you know, just do the algebra to figure out what the point R is, all of a sudden, this bizarre point pops up. This integral point 35, 207 pops up, pops up as well. So we get another rational point. But now, here's what we can do. We know that if r is a point in this curve, then minus r, well, sorry, then reflecting the point across the x-axis must also be a, a, a point in the curve, right? Because it's symmetric across the x-axis. We're gonna denote this point by minus r. And now we can do the same thing. The same thing again. We can kind of draw a line through the point P and minus R, and what happens now? When we draw the point, the line through the point P and minus R, we must get another uh, point where the, where the line intersects the curve. So let me denote this point by S. So you see we get a, 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 another point S, and lo and behold, that must also be a rational point by the same argument, right? If P and minus R are rational points, S must also be a rational point. So we get another rational point. This one doesn't look as pretty. You see it's some crazy rational number, but it is a rational point that we get. 
fantastic. And we can keep doing this again and again and again, right? So here, we can take the point uh, S, reflect it to get minus S, and we can pass a line through P and minus S and get yet another rational point. And we can keep doing this over and over and over and over and build lots and lots of rational points. And this made Diophantos very happy, we think. Yes? So this is a way for him to build lots and lots of rational points. By the way, if any of you have ever used PowerPoint, you know that it's extremely complicated to make these animations. So I'm going to make you watch this one more time, given that I did all this work. <laughs> yeah, so here we have our points P and Q. Yeah, we draw a line. We find the third intersection point. Uh, we draw a line. We reflect. We draw another line. And we get another intersection point. We reflect. We draw another line. And we get another intersection point, and so on and so forth. So is this clear? So given two rational points, this gives us a way to build another rational point. And by iterating this, we can build lots and lots of rational points. By the way, there's this nice book, very, very fun book to read. I really enjoyed reading this book by Bash Makova uh, back in 1997. It's actually a translation from Russian. That what she did is she actually went through Diophantus' work and translated all of his ideas to, uh, to modern mathematical language. So this is where, um, this is how uh, we kind of view uh, his work. It's really quite impressive that his ideas have kind of uh, uh, lasted, uh, lived and lasted this long. OK, but now that, we, now that you see this, uh, this operation, right, two points give us a third point, you kind of get a very natural sense of, hey, maybe there's some sort of a addition operation going on here. Right? Given two points, P and Q, it kind of makes sense to sort of define a sum of two points as, in some sense, as the third intersection point. So in fact, what we do is, again, we're going to draw the lines through the points P and Q. We're going to, again, have our point R as the third inter intersection point. And we're going to come up with this strange looking definition as saying that P plus, it's a funny plus. Yeah, it's not your natural point addition. It's this funny, funny operation that I'm going to denote by a plus within, inside of a box. And in fact, the way I'm going to define it is as the sum of P and Q is not going to be the point R, but rather the reflection of the point R across the x-axis. Okay, so we're going to say, we're going to say that actually P plus Q is going to be minus the point R. Is that clear? So sum two points, take the two points P and Q, draw the line through them, and reflect. And that will give us the uh, addition of that. We're going to define that as the sum of the points P and Q. That looks like a bizarre thing to do. Why should we reflect? And why are we doing this intersection at all? But it turns out, if you define it this way, then something magical happens. The magic that happens is we get the property of addition, which we call, this, we call associativity. So what is associativity? Associativity means that basically it doesn't matter what order you do this addition in. So you see P plus Q doing that first and adding T is the same as P plus Q plus T. Now, if you think about this, this is totally bizarre. Like, why should this, why should this be true? Why, why should possibly, why should you have this associativity property? Let's think for just one second about what this means. What it means is, again, if you draw the line through P and Q, and you look at the third intersection point, and you draw a line through that point and T, you're going to get exactly the same point as if you drew a line through Q and T, you looked at that intersection point, and then you drew a line through P. Yeah, these are kind of completely different operations you're doing. These two things should have nothing to do with one another. And yet, you get exactly the same point at the end. Yeah, and in fact, you can do 10 pages of algebra to prove that this is, this, this is correct. But in fact, there are much easier ways and more direct ways uh, to see that this is correct. Yeah, so this has been um, uh, 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 discovered, this has been discovered again and again and again over the ages until it was finally, um, at least in the case of rational points, this was finally kind of solidified in a paper of, uh, of Poincaré in the early 1900s. Yeah, so since, since the order of operations doesn't matter, we can simply write P plus Q plus T. Is everybody okay with this? So this gives us a funny way to add points. So we can add points on this, on this uh, curve and build new points from given points. So far, so good? Good. Any questions so far? Uh, it's not really about P plus P. Ah, excellent, excellent question. Excellent. Luca is exactly right. So if we have three different, if we have two different points, it's pretty clear what P plus Q is going to be. But what do we do if we have, if we want to compute P plus P? There's no line that goes through P, that goes through P and P, right? It's just one point. So what do we do in that case? So what do we do if we want to add the same point to itself? In other words, we're in, we want to compute, well, P plus P. Well, the solution is actually not that difficult. Basically, you can kind of think of the two points P and Q as kind of converging to each other. So kind of, you, you kind of move them closer, closer and closer and closer to one another, all, all the time kind of running the, the line that goes through them until finally the points meet. 
And if you remember your high school math, when the two, line, when the two points meet, the line that goes to the curve is called a tangent. Okay, so we actually compute the tangent in that point uh, to the point P, and the tangent is gonna intersect the curve at another point which we call R. Again, we're gonna reflect the point R, and that's what we're gonna define as P plus P. So far so good? So that's how we can actually double points. So we can compute P plus Q when P and Q are different. We can compute P plus P when, P, uh, when, when the two points are, are the same. And, because, and again, because of associativity, now we can write 2P, 3P, 4P. We don't have to worry about the order of operations. We don't have to put parentheses around these additions because of this associativity property. So we have a very nice sequence of points here, 2P, 3P, 4P, 5P, 6P, and so on and so forth. And so again, this gives us, gives us a really nice way to build new rational points from just one point P. So if I have one point on the curve, I can compute P plus P, then P plus P plus P, P plus P plus P plus P, and so on and so forth. And every time, uh, you know, there's a chance that I'll get a new rational point. And in fact, on the, on the curve that I showed you, the Afonso's curve, we'll actually end up getting infinitely many points like this. Okay, so that's how we double points. There's one last corner case. Let's see if anyone can see. There's one last corner case when we run into, into trouble. Yes? What if you have P, P to minus P? Exactly, excellent. I was waiting for that. Excellent, excellent. Ah, actually, hold on. I have some fancy animations to show you first. So here, we can take uh, the points P and R and we get 2P. Now we can, we can uh, pass a line through the point P and 2P. We get another point, we reflect that, and we're gonna get the point 3P, and we can continue computing this way and get 4P, 5P. So it gives us an algorithm, a very simple algorithm to generate more rational points on the curve. Now the last corner case I have to worry about is what do we do if we have P and minus P? The line through P and minus P doesn't really intersect the curve anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, it only intersects the curve at those two points and nowhere else. So I kind of lied to you when I said that every line must intersect the curve at three points. In fact, here's a line that only intersect the curves at two points, two points. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we sort of cheat, but there's a formal justification for why we cheat. What we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce one more kind of artificial point, which we'll call the point in infinity, and we'll say this funny curve intersects the, intersects the curve at infinity, and we'll call this special point O, and that makes our, uh, that, 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 that's the last point that we have on the curve. Okay, so we can define P plus minus P to be O, and in fact, P plus O therefore would be P, so O is like zero. That's why we use O to denote it, um, and now we're all happy. Now we have a complete way to kind of add two points, and so we have a nice addition rule. So just to summarize everything I've said so far, uh, just to, this is a quick summary. So we have our curve, we have two points, P and Q, we can add two points, so given P and Q, we can compute the point P funny addition Q using the following rules. So if, first of all, if P is negative Q, yeah, if P is equal to negative Q, then the sum is just this point at infinity, the zero point. If, if we want to double, so if P is equal to Q, the doubling rule is you compute the slope of the tangent. Just again, this just happens to be the slope of the line that's tangent at the point P and you just plug the number, the values into this formula and you get the, the, the point R, yeah? So you get XR and YR, together they make up the point R. So far so good, so that's how we get our, uh, our, our, our sum of two point, of a point, sorry, a doubling of a point um, if, the, if uh, we just wanna double a point and if we wanna add two points, then you know, again, we compute the, the, the slope of the line that goes through P and Q and that gives us the third point, that gives us the third point R. I just wanted you to see that there are kind of explicit formulas that we can use. They're very easy to, co to compute, very efficient. You can see all we're doing is just computing some squares and divisions, another square. They're very efficient to compute. So I guess point doubling is two squarings and one division and a couple of additions. So very efficient, very fast operations. So now that we understand this idea, let's go back to Diophantus' curve. So here we have our curve uh, x cubed minus x plus nine. And here we have the point one and minus, minus three that we started with. The point two P, if we double the point, yeah, if we just compute P plus P, again, means we pass a line through P, we look at the intersection point and we reflect, we get this funny point, uh, what, what we're we denoted by two P. And in fact, this is what Diophantus did. Yeah, so Diophantus kind of got the point two P and that's where he stopped. He, didn't, he was happy that he got one more rational point and that nothing else interested him. This was kind of a problem with his approach. He never kind of asked for a complete answer, he just wanted one solution, and that's all he cared about. 
fine, but we can continue, right? We can continue and compute the point 3p and 4p, and you see these points kind of get uglier and uglier and uglier as we, as we go along. But again, we have an algorithm here that produces pr lots and lots of new rational points on this curve. So what's the next question? So now we have all these rational points on the curve. What's the most natural question to ask now? Is what? Uh, can you get as close as you want to to any points? Ah, well, actually, that's a good question. But the one I had in mind is, <laughs> yes, thank you, is are these all the rational points on the curve? Are we getting all the points that are on the curve this way? Yeah, very natural question. And it turns out the answer is no. In fact, um, if we look at the point Q, which is 0, 3, one of the integer points that we had before, we're never going to get that point as a multiple of the point P. Okay? So we can take the point Q, 0, 3, and now we can generate more points, right? So 2Q, 3Q, 4Q. By the way, it's kind of bizarre that the point 3Q gives you all of a sudden this funny integer point. Yeah, this kind of pops out of nowhere. Like this bizarre, why, why do these integers have to s sit on this curve? But again, turns out there's deep, deeper reasons for everything. There's a good reason why, why they're on this curve. Uh, but yeah, so this gives us a way to generate more, more, more points. But now that we have these points P and Q, we can look at even combinations of them, right? So we can do P minus Q, 2P plus Q, P plus 2Q. Yeah, we can start combining them to form more and more and more curves, more and more points. And now the question is, are these all the rational points on the curve, right? Can you generate like all points on the curve, rational points as linear combinations of P and Q? So in fact, this is true. Yeah, so there's a, rational, there's a theorem that says that in fact, all the rational points on Diophantus' curve can be obtained basically by taking integer combinations of P and Q. Okay, so again, I want to make sure it's clear what I mean by integer, integer combinations here. You take the point P, you do this funny doubling to multiply it by U, by some integer U. You take the point Q, you do doubling to multiply it by the integer V. You sum up the two points, and that gives you another point on the curve. Okay, and if you do this for all integers U and V, you basically get all the points, points on this curve. And again, there's a paper by, uh, from 2002 that analyzes this particular curve, and in fact, it shows that these are all the rational points on this curve. So the fact that we can generate all rational points by two points, P and Q, means that the rank of the curve, we, then that, that when we say that the rank of this curve is two. Yeah, it takes two points to generate all rational points. Now there are all sorts of interesting computational problems that come up. Yeah, so this kind of now boils down, this leads directly to a computer science question, which is, well, if I give you an, an equation for an elliptic curve, I give you the A and B that define an, an elliptic curve, can you compute its rank efficiently? Yeah, is there an algorithm to do it? Turns out that's actually quite a difficult problem. Uh, yeah, computing it exactly. Uh, however, uh, there's a, well, there's a beautiful uh, op conjecture in, in, in mathematics called the, um, the uh, Burt's one or Dyer conjecture, B, the BSD conjecture, that if it happens to be true, this is actually one of the deepest problems in, um, in uh, well, in mathematics and algebraic geometry in particular. If it turns out to be true, then we get a, actually an algorithm that pretty much gives us, more or less, actually gives us the actual rank of a curve, yeah? So you can see how the deepest problems in mathematics really are just computer science problems. Yeah, it gives us an algorithm to, uh, we're looking for an algorithm to compute ranks, and we need this, uh, we have an algorithm, can, we have a candidate algorithm, except we can't prove that it works. And if you could prove that it works, you will get a million dollars from the Clay Institutes, because that's actually one of the millennium problems that's considered one of the um, deep problems in mathematics. Yeah, so we also know, for example, that the rank of every, yeah, so we know that the rank of every curve is finite. So the question is, you know, can it be, is there a bound on the rank? Again, can, can we compute the rank? Um, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there are very, uh, well, I guess another problem is, uh, given a curve, can you actually come up with an algorithm to find rational points on this curve? Yeah, it turns out if the BSD conjecture is true, we actually have also have a decent algorithm for coming up with rational points on these curves. So again, these deep problems in mathematics really are just computer science theory problems. Yes, so this deep connection is there. Okay, so the last thing I want to tell you before we switch over to crypto is that in fact when you study these questions of rational points on these curves, actually the correct way to do it is, or, there, or rather there's a lot of information to be gained by looking at actually curves modulo primes. Okay, so instead of looking at the curve over the rationals, let's actually ask how many solutions or what are the solutions or uh, what are the points on this curve actually modulo a particular prime p, say. Okay, so here we have, uh, so let's say that fp is the set of numbers 0 to p minus 1. In fact, here I'm going to be a little imprecise and I'm going to literally think of fp as the set of integers 0 to p minus 1. 
and I'm asking what is the set of points x, y in fp, uh, you know, pairs in fp times fp that satisfies this equation. Okay, so we're asking for solutions now modulo the prime p. And again, let's look at Diophantus' curve. So let's say we look at Diophantus' curve mod 7, and so we have our integral points. Of course, if we have an integer point, that's also an in integer point mod 7. But all of a sudden, another point pops up. Yes, somebody had a question. Um, if you go back to the last slide, you yes. know, with addition, you create this concept of multiplication. But uh, it seems like you keep on progressing right along the curve. So I was wondering if you would talk about finding the inverse of u of b, like if there's some analog to division or finding the inverse, or going left along the curve to find more rapid. Well, given, given uh, p, you can easily build minus p just by reflecting. Given 2p, you can easily build minus 2p just by reflecting. But if there's something like 1 over u. Ah, <laughs> that's a good question. So, like, could you have, uh, so, like, 1 over u is not an integer. Is that, what, what, what does it mean? Sorry, 1 over p. Like, is there a way to, I guess, like, here, okay. Yeah. I don't no, 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 this is, a good, this is a good question. Like, you're asking me, like, what is half p? What is a third p? What is a fourth p? Yeah? Okay, so it's a good question, but actually not one that would take a, a little while to, to answer, so I'm actually not going to answer it now. Come see me after the, after the lecture. Yes, there is a good answer. I mean, okay, I'm not going to answer that now. <laughs> okay. All right, so we have our curves. So, the, so we were looking at curves modulo these primes. For example, we can look at the Euphantis' curve modulo 7. So we have our integral points. Of course, if it's a solution over the integers, it's going to be a solution modulo 7. But all of a sudden, a new point pops up. Yeah, there's this point 2 minus 1, 2 plus minus 1. So 2, 1, and 2 minus 1 that pops up. And you can very easily see that, in fact, if we plug in y equals 1 and x equals 2, yeah, so we plug in the point into the Euphantis' curve, you see that when we evaluate, well, you see that when we evaluate, basically we see that we, we get that actually 1 is equal to 15 modulo 7. Both of these are actually 1 modulo 7. So therefore, the point 2, 1 really is a point on this curve, modulo 7. So on this particular curve, modulo 7, you see if you just count, you'll see there are nine points, right? There's the point in infinity, and then there's these four other points on the, in the, in, in, in the basically in, um, uh, in FP cross FP. Okay, so there are nine points on this curve. Yeah, and now we can do, the interesting thing about this is now we can apply the, our funny, you know, addition formulas, uh, addition rules, actually modulo 7. So if I, I take two points, I can add them up modulo 7, and I get another point. So here, for example, these two integral points, if I add them up, I get the new point, 2, 1. So we get a nice addition rule on nine points, and that gives us actually a way, well, you know, it's a nice addition rule that we can use. And remember, we have this associativity property that the order of addition doesn't really matter. Okay, so the next question is, well, how many points are there on this curve modulo p? And it turns out there's a beautiful, beautiful result. This is actually one of the most wonderful results um, um, on, in this space that actually shows, gives you actually a really good bound on the number of points modulo p. I'm not going to be very explicit about this. I'll just say that the number of points on the curve modulo p is not p, but it's very close to p. Yeah, so it's mo at most like two square root of p away from, uh, from the prime p. So the number of points is very, very close to p. Just remember that because it'll become important in a minute. And the amazing thing is actually this result that's due to Hase and, and Wei, uh, actually not only does it give you a bound of number of points, but in fact it gives you efficient algorithms to compute the number of points on the curve. Yeah, this is an amazing fact that it doesn't matter how big p is, b could be an enormously big number, you can still count the number of points on this curve in, in time that's only polynomial in the logarithm of p. Yeah, and this you get, you can only do this if you have a really good understanding of what these points are, and that's exactly what this theorem gives you. Kind of gives you a lot of information about how, how the points behave, and that gives you an algorithm to actually count the number of points on these curves. Okay, so this will become important in just a minute. Okay, so this is like the quick overview of Diophantus' work, yes? So, and again, what I wanted to, to tell you is, first of all, all this beautiful theory developed essentially for no reason, right? Nobody really needs rational points on curves. Yeah, so what, why, why, I mean, there's a lot of work that went into this. It's beautiful, beautiful work, lots of intellectual curiosity, but there was no reason, no, 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 like, no application for why this stuff is needed. So you should be asking, you're probably wondering, like, why am I telling you all this? Like, what does this have to do with secure communication? And it turns out this 
beautiful theory that was developed turns out to be immensely, immensely useful. You're using this now every day when you browse the web, every day. It's really quite remarkable how something that had basically was developed just for intellectual curiosity has actually taken over the world. And so let me show you why. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about modern crypto. And let's see what actually, how this thing is actually useful. OK, so uh, you know, in crypto, basically, there is the classical part of crypto, which says, imagine I, my, I have my browser and I'm trying to connect to my bank. Well, let's imagine that my browser and my bank actually already have a shared key. So there's a key that my, that my browser know, knows and a key that my bank knows, and nobody else knows what this key is. Well, it, in that case, it turns out we already know how to communicate securely, how to send secure messages from one to the other. There's a particular mode I imagine many of you know. It's called AES-GCM that allows us to send messages in such a way that even if an eaves eavesdropper listens to the conversation, I'm going to call the eavesdropper Nancy, because that's the closest name I can think of to a, some three-letter agency. Uh, so even if Nancy eavesdrops on the conversation, she's not going to be able to figure out what, uh, what is being transmitted. Okay? Interestingly, it's, you, know, you think this is like the most basic problem in crypto. right? The two sides share a key. They want to send messages to one another. Interestingly, it's only in like 2005 that we learned how to do this correctly. If even now, there are debates on whether that's correct, and there's even something called the Caesar competition, which is looking for the next round, next way of encrypting when the two sides share a secret key. Like even the, the most basic problem, this is, this is like crypto 101. Even the most basic problem in crypto is still something that is still an active area of research, and things are going to be changing over the years. But today, when you encrypt, you will use this GCM mode there's a lot of support for it, and that's most what, mostly what your browser does. OK, but now that you see this, the obvious question is, where did this shared key between Alice and her bank come from? Where did it actually come from? And so the solution to that actually is due to a very famous trio, uh, Diffie, Hellman, and Merkel, uh, working many years ago at Stanford, actually. Here's a picture of them from, their, from the old, ages, old age when they, when they did this work. And they came up with this beautiful idea. Again, I imagine many of you know this, this idea, so let me kind of go through it uh, somewhat quickly. Uh, so they came up with this beautiful idea for generating a shared key between Alice's laptop and her bank. And the idea is as follows. Basically, you're going to fix a prime, some prime p, and an element and some number g between 1 and p. Fix that, those two numbers. And now what Alice will do is she's going to choose some random integer a in the range 1 to p minus 1. She's going to send over g to the a to the bank. Yeah, so she just sends that in the clear. And then the bank does exactly the same thing. Uh, picks a random b and sends over g to the b over to Alice. Now what Alice, and Bob, what Alice and the bank will do is, well, they can generate their shared key as follows. Basically, uh, the, uh, Alice, what she does is she takes the value that she got from the bank, raises it to the power of her random a. And you notice by rules of exponentiation, b to the a is just g to the b to the a, which is g to the a b. Yeah, so that, that's the value that she gets. And uh, the bank does exactly the same thing. And lo and behold, they get actually the same value. Okay, so just again, rules of exponentiation, if you just remember your basic rules of exponentiation, that b times a is equal to a times b, and that guarantees that both of them get the same, the same value. This is a very basic protocol. Uh, and from g, this g to the a b, you can actually generate a shared secret between the two, the two sides. So the first question you should ask me is, why is this secure? Yeah, clearly it works. But the question is, why? Why is this secure? And so the security of this protocol actually depends on the following problem. Yeah, so we're getting to the punchline in just a minute. Um, yeah, so we have our, our public values P and G. You notice that the adversary, when he is, so Nancy, yes, when she eavesdrops on this, on this channel, what she gets to see is, again, the public values P and G. She gets to see the, the, the public values that the participants send, this A and B. And what she would like to compute is the secret that they're going to compute, that they're going to jointly compute. So what she'd like to compute is just G to the A, B value. So far, so good. That's what she'd like to do. This problem is an extremely famous problem in crypto. It's called, so famous that it's got, it's, it has a name. It's called the computational Diffie-Hellman problem, or CDH for short. So I'm going to refer to this as CG, CDH from now on. Basically, the problem is given g, g to the a, and g to the b, can you compute g to the a, b? Okay? So the question we're asking, really, the security of this method depends on how hard is this CDH problem. Yeah? So how hard is the CDH problem modulo p? 
Well, unfortunately, this problem is not as hard. By the way, this is the only field that you can think of, well, the only field that, that, that we know of where a fast algorithm is actually a huge problem. Yeah, usually we want fast algorithms. Here, fast algorithms are real, a real problem. Yeah, so the question we're asking is, how hard is the CDH problem mod P? And it turns out there are beautiful, beautiful algorithms, quite deep and you know, about 20 years old, that show that this problem is not as hard as you'd like. Yeah, so if you have an n-digit prime, there is an algorithm that solves this problem in exponential time, but the exponent is the cube root of n. Cube root of n. This is much, much faster than a, an exponential time algorithm, which would be 2 to the n. Yes? So basically what I'm saying is that the CDH problem, there is a relatively efficient algorithm. Even though it is exponential, the exponent is not as big as we'd like it to be. And as a result, the world record in computing and solve in breaking the CDH problem actually allows you to do it for 180 digit prime. Yeah, this is kind of mind boggling that we can do it. So the number is two to the, two, 10 to the 180, yeah, 180 digit prime, 10 to the 180, scanning through all possible, no, possible solutions, kind of uh, breaking it by brute force would take more time than you know, the age of the universe squared. And yet, we can do it. We can do it, and it only, only takes 50 years, 50, 50 core years, which means with 50 computers, you can do it in one year, for example. So yeah, unfortunately, this problem uh, is just not that hard. Somebody had a question. Oh, I was just um, wanting to clarify what you meant by time. Uh, yeah, so think of it time, think of it as uh, cycles on the computer. Yeah, just very simple. Um, yeah, x86 cycles to be, con to, be, to be concrete. Other questions? Yeah. Similarly, what, what did you mean by random? Can we buy one on Amazon? Random? What is random? Random made. Oh, no, no, no. You cannot buy one on Amazon. You have to generate it yourself. Yeah, you, you have to have, yeah. How to generate randomness is a whole other talk, which I'll be happy. That's another crypto story, but that's a story for a different day. How to generate randomness on a computer? Uh, big problems there, but let's assume that's already, we already know how to, how to do that. Any other questions? Okay, we're getting to the interesting parts. Okay, so fine. So uh, yeah, so this problem unfortunately is not very, not very hard, and as a result, if we, want it, if we want it to be difficult for Nancy to solve this problem, in practice what we end up doing is we end up using really, really big primes, like 607, 17 uh, digit primes. Okay, so because the primes are this big, basically they're 2048 bits, because the primes are this big, basically that means that that famous protocol, this Diffie-Hellman famous protocol, is relatively expensive, relatively slow. Yeah, we have to do computations modulo very, very large numbers, and that's not good for performance. So think about Google on their servers, they have to constantly be doing these exponentiations modulo, these 617 digit primes, and unfortunately, that's just expensive to do. Yeah? How did you know it was prime? How did I know it was prime? Excellent question. Okay, so a whole other story I could have told you, I could have talked about is how do we test if a number is prime or not? That is actually a very, very long and fascinating story. But again, we have good ways to test that a number is prime. In fact, we even have ways to do it provably. Uh, but again, that's a story for another day. So today, let's assume that we have ways to tell that the number actually is prime. Yeah, excellent question. Okay, so that's basically uh, where, where things were. And that actually is unfortunately quite sad because again, this means that key exchange is expensive, which means Google has to buy many more machines to satisfy uh, the world's needs, okay? So what happened? So what happened? Amaz the amazing thing is, the question is, can we use, so what happens when we run this protocol using the funny group that Diophantus was interested in, right? So Diophantus' work, all of a sudden, 1800 years ago, well, at least a modern version of it, all of a sudden uh, starts to apply to this key exchange problem. So the question is, what happens if we run the exact same protocol, except it's, instead of doing multiplication modulo p, we do this funny thing with lines through curves, and that's, that's going to be our definition of multiplication. So we're going to fix a prime p, we're going to fix a curve modulo p, and we're going to fix a point p on this curve. And what Alice and her bank will do is exactly the same thing as before. Alice will choose some random number u. Now, instead of sending g to the u, she's going to send u times the point p. And by now, you guys are all experts at what does it mean to multiply a point by an integer on the curve. Yeah, so you know what 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p, you know what that is. Now, here what I'm telling you is let's multiply it by some 
rep by some number u that only Alice knows. Okay, so Alice will send u times p. Bob will do exactly the same thing. He'll send v times p. And the secret key is going to be exactly what they did before, exactly the same Diffie-Hellman protocol, except now done on these points on these curves. Okay, so Alice will take the value she got from Bob, multiplied uh, from the bank, multiplied by u, and you can see you get uh, u v times p. And Alice and the bank will do exactly the same thing, and again, they get exactly the same point. The reason they get the same point is because of the associativity property. Yeah, the magical associativity property I told you about guarantees that both of them actually get the same value. Yes, so again, we get this, 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 we get this protocol that works exactly as before, but now on elliptic curves. And this idea, by the way, I should say, is due to uh, Koblitz of Victor Miller and uh, commercialized by Scott Vanstone. And what's the question that you need to ask? Clearly, the protocol works. The question is, how secure is this method? Yeah, how hard is this method to break? So our friend Nancy, how long would it take her to break uh, this, this CDH problem? So how hard is the CDH problem on the curve? Again, what she would need to do is given the point P, the point UP, and the point VP, she would need to compute the point U times VP. Okay, so the question is how hard is this to do? And here, magically, yeah, this, this group here actually, sorry, this, this addition rule here has so little structure, or let's say far less structure than working modulo primes, that in fact the best known algorithm now is much, much worse than it is working modulo primes. Okay, so in fact the best known alg algorithm now is basically exponential, whereas before, you notice this, this cube root of n that was causing trouble before disappeared. Now the best known algorithm for breaking CDH basically is an exponential time algorithm. So the problem is much harder. The fact that it's harder means that we can actually use smaller primes in our protocol and still have the protocol be secure. In fact, I'll tell you in practice what, uh, sorry, I, I should say the world record for computing CDH modulo uh, on, on these curves is actually um, a 34 digit number, 34. Remember for when we were working mod P, the world record was 180 digits. For elliptic curves, the world record is only 34 digits. The problem is so hard that we can't do anything beyond 34 digits. Yes? And in fact, in practice, what's being used is just a 77 digit prime. Not 600 digits like before, but only 77 digits. Because the prime is so much shorter, and yet the problem is as hard as working modulo P, yes, with the, with the, with the simple, with the simple uh, multiplication, we can, we, so again, the prime is so much shorter that the algorithm actually runs much, much, much faster, around 10 times faster than if we just did simple mod P operations. So far so good? So because the problem is harder, we can get everything to run faster. Fantastic. So, so this is good. Yes, question. So Alice has to compute UP from P. Why yes. is that any easier than computing UVP from VP? So she has to compute U times P from P. Why is that easier than computing UV from VP? Well, uh, Alice can do that. The question is whether, the, whether Nancy, the eavesdropper, whether she can do that. She doesn't have U and she doesn't have V. Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent question. She doesn't have U and she doesn't have V, and yes, she's supposed to compute U, V times P. Yeah, so that's the problem. That's the thing that we believe is hard. And in fact, because this is so much faster, like I said, this is 10 times faster than just working modular primes, this thing is literally taking over the world, and so every time you guys connect to Google, what's actually being done, if you look down here, you'll see that your secure connection to Google actually uses what's called elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. Yeah? So every day, every day, when you connect to Google, you're actually, you should be thanking Diophantos for his work because that's exactly 1,800 years ago. That led directly to this method. To me, this is a, a, an unbelievable story of something that was just developed for complete intellectual curiosity. All of a sudden, it's something that the whole earth is using on a daily basis all the time. If you're a fan of Bitcoin, these curves are also used in Bitcoin to verify to ensure that money is not being spent incorrectly. So these curves are basically taking over the world and slowly uh, the, whole, uh, the whole world of implementing crypto is moving to implementing them in this particular way. Now here comes the troubling part. The troubling part, the question is, we know that these curves are good for crypto because you know, they make things faster. The question is what curve should we actually use? Well, so what curve should we use? So what happened here is basically the government ste stepped in and said, here's the curve, you know, government to the rescue. 
And the, here is the curve that you should all be using. Now, you know the joke about, you know, I'm here for the government and I'm here to help you? Um, yes, how do you know when someone is lying? Uh, <laughs> well, no, I'm kidding. I don't, we don't know. They were actually trying to do the right thing. Um, but let me tell you the story. I'm, I'm kidding, actually. They were trying to do the right thing. Um, but the National Institute of Standards basically standardized one, well, a small set of curves, uh, but there's one curve that's basically taken over the world. This curve is called P256 uh, because of its parameters. The curve is defined by this equation here where the value B is literally specified in the standard. You can see what B is. Uh, here's the prime that they, they, they standardized. So this is a curve modulo this prime. Here's the number of points on this curve. It's this crazy number over here. Uh, and here's the point P that's on this curve. This is the point that you're supposed to use when you do the key exchange. Okay, so the National Institute of Standards actually tells you which curve you're supposed to be doing, and that's the one that, that most websites uh, use. So again, if you had told Diophantos that his work is going to be standardized by the government, I think he would be somewhat surprised. Yes? Do we know anything about the reasoning behind the NIST standard? Yes, excellent question. I'm going to get to that in just one second. So just to kind of finish the point here, basically we did a survey of different websites of the, uh, the something, something like 60% of all websites, you know, the popular websites support the elliptic curve uh, key exchange, and like 96% of them use this one particular curve. One particular curve, yes? So it's natural to ask, where does this curve come from? Where did it come from? Well, you open up the standard, and here's what it says. In the standard, it says there's a particular seed, literally, there's a seed that's written in the standard. If you compute the SHA-1 hash of this, of this magical value that's in the standard, basically it gives you the parameters for the curve. So the value B, the, the value P and the value B that defines the curve, basically come from this, from this seed. So the question now is, well, where did the seed come from? And the answer is, we have no idea. Yeah, it's literally written in the standard and we have no idea how it was generated. There are some uh, claims as to how it was generated, but we have no way to verify it. So the problem now is, uh, well, well, so we have this one curve generated magically, and the question is, you know, how hard is the CDH problem on this one particular curve? We know that there are some curves where the CDH problem is easy. How do we know that this curve is not one of those curves? Yes, we don't. That's the answer. Question, yes. I'm not a CS major, so I apologize if this is uh, asinine, but why is the seed hash? What, what does that create? Or, or what is it? Well, the seed is hash to basic, basically to give you some confidence in that uh, it wasn't chosen uh, totally adversarially. So that there's some munging and crunching that went into it uh, so that presumably this curve was generated, you know, not, you know, with some, some um, with, uh, without giving complete control of what the parameters are. Yeah, that's, that's the simple answer. Yes, question. But is an SSG point now broken? It yeah, it's broken as a cryptographic hash, but that's not relevant to, the, to, this, to, this, to this discussion. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. Yeah. So, so Nancy had no input onto That's exactly the question. That is exactly the question. So the question was, uh, did Nancy have any input as to what the seed is supposed to be? And the answer is, we don't know. Yeah. Imagine, so the, the, the situation that we're all fearful of is imagine one in a million curves happen to have an easy CDH problem. Yes, one in a million curves. What that would mean is you would have to cycle through a million random seeds until you find one that you can break, and that's the one that you publish in the standard. That's what everybody's fearful of. This has international consequences. Yes, so the Chinese are kind of worried about using this curve. The Russians are worried about using this curve. This, it's quite remarkable, the impact, the international impact. This basically causes an international incident, yeah? I think this is the first time that math causes international incidents, yeah? Uh, so it's quite remarkable what's happening here. And in fact, because of this, the National Institute of Standards has actually decided to backpedal away from this curve. And next month, they're actually running a workshop on discussing how to, how to generate uh, better curves. This is a very, very active area of research. How should we generate curves? The deep question here, what we would love to have is basically one curve that is as hard as all other curves. In other words, if you can break the CDH problem on this one curve, that would mean that you can break CDH on all curves. So if there's some curve that's hard, this one curve must also be hard. That's what we would like to have, but unfortunately we don't know how to do that. Yes? Uh, what makes a curve hard or not? Uh, the question, when I say hard, I mean, is the CDH problem, does it take exponential time to solve? So a curve is hard if CDH takes exponential time to solve. So what characteristics of the curve? 
curve makes a CDH problem? That's the problem. We don't know. We don't know. Yeah, this is actually one of the most embarrassing problems of computer science, right? It's been, the field is 50 years old, and yet we can't prove that anything is hard. That's, that's, the, that's the state we have to live in, and yet we have to do practical crypto. And so we have to assume that certain problems are hard. And the question is, what problems do we assume are hard? Well, we'd like to have problems that are as hard as possible, in the sense that if they're broken, then a huge collection of problems is also broken. So we'd like to have one curve that if this curve is broken, all other curves must also, must also be broken, but that we don't know how to do. There are other constructs in crypto that actually do have this property, but curves do not have this property. So that's, that's where the debate is, basically. How do we generate these curves? These curves, it's a very active area of research. Now, obviously, these days, you can't talk about uh, crypto without mentioning Nancy uh, more explicitly. And so what, are they, what does the NSA say about this problem? Well, so they have a, on their website, they actually make a very strong case for using these elliptic curves. In particular, they kind of say, if you want this level of security, they go through a very rigorous analysis to say, this, it'll be basically, you, you'll have a 10x performance increase. Yes, 10x, very enticing, and this is why the world is actually moving to these curves. Now, on the bottom, they say, basically, elliptic curve cryptography provides greater security and more efficient performance than the first generation public key techniques. As vendors look to upgrade their systems, they should seriously consider the elliptic curve alternative for computational and bandwidth advantages. Now, here's the frustrating thing about doing crypto in the real world these days. As you know, the NSA has two parts, right? They're in charge both of defensive and of offensive technologies. The problem is, we have no idea which part of the NSA is actually sending us this message. <laughs> yes, this is what's, what's frustrating. Um, but that's the world we live in. I guess that's what makes crypto interesting. But that's kind of the policy uh, debate that, that, goes, that goes on here. Yeah? I just want to understand sort of politically or mechanically, what power does NIST have to enforce this software? I mean, so you, I think you said 96% of what yes. is this well, it's done by choice, basically. So developers at these websites, they choose to use the, the NIST curve because that's what is typically implemented in most cryptographic libraries. Yeah? There are other curves that are being debated. Um, today, what's implemented is the NIST curves. It's going to be many, many years before implementations are changed to move away from the NIST curve. So we're kind of stuck with them for quite a while. But at least, you know, we're, the debate is starting as to what new curves we should be using. To me, and the reason I wanted to tell you the story, to me this is incredible that this deep math that was developed is causing such a crisis on an international level. It's really quite a remarkable story. Uh, okay, so with that, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna move over to, um, to more recent work in crypto. And so let me conclude with, with one last topic in the remaining few minutes I have. I'll stop in, in five minutes or so. Um, which is to say, well, what if the computational Diffie-Hellman problem was really, really easy? Yeah, so imagine, imagine we had a curve that had the following bizarre property. Imagine the curve had the property that uh, given UP and VP, it's actually easy to compute v UVP. So in other words, the CDH problem is just trivial on this curve. However, the following, uh, a slightly different problem still was hard, namely just given U times P, it's difficult to recover U. Okay, this problem has a name, it's called a discrete log problem. So imagine that CDH was actually easy, but this problem over here was actually hard. This would be a disaster for key exchange. The Diffie-Hellman protocol would be broken because the attacker, given UP and VP, he can actually compute the secret key between Alice and the bank. But it turns out if we had such a structure, it would be an enormous benefit for crypto. There's tons and tons of application that we can do. Uh, and let me show you why this would be such an interesting, uh, it's kind of a bizarre construct, right? Uh, so all of a sudden you can solve CDH, but there's this other problem that's still difficult. Why is it such a useful, why would it be so useful for crypto? Well, you can sort of a, think of a funny encryption mechanism where the way I encrypt the message M is the, the ciphertext is literally M times the point P. Okay, so the encryption of a message M is M times P. Now this encryption scheme, because CDH is easy, has a couple of remarkable properties. Yeah, in particular, if I give you two ciphertexts, I give you M1P and M2P. These are two, this is an encryption of M1 and this is an encryption of M2. If you think about it, if you add these two ciphertexts together, add in the sense of adding points on curves, you get M1 plus M2 times P. And because CDH is easy, you can compute M1 times M2 times P. Yeah, so basically, 
what you're doing here is you're able to compute on ciphertext, right? You're able to add the plain text and you're able to multiply the plain text without knowing what the plain text are, just given the encryption of those plain texts. Now, if you can do addition or multiplication, you can do any function you want. Okay, so just given the encryption of a particular message, you can compute the encryption of a function of that message. So this is what's called computations on a ciphertext. It also goes by the name of uh, fully homomorphic encryption, if you've heard of it. Um, and in fact, this exact structure, if we had such a construct, if we had such an algebraic uh, structure where CDH was easy but discrete log was hard, we could actually build very secure, very simple fully homomorphic encryption schemes. And in fact, this would be um, fantastic. I mean, this, this, this type of construct would have lots and lots and lots of other applications. Okay, so unfortunately, this is an open problem. We don't know how to build this. Today, we don't know how to build this. But who knows, maybe one of you will come up with, uh, with a solution to this. So yeah, I'd like to pose this as an open problem. We have some evidence that maybe this is not possible, but it's not conclusive evidence. There's still definitely hope that this can be done. So I hope, the, is the problem clear? When you go hope, home tonight, I hope you will think a little bit, um, yeah, can you actually construct some sort of algebraic structure that has, these, that has these properties. Yeah, so CDH is easy, but discrete log is hard. So since we'd, really, we'd really like to have this, we'd really like to be able to do computations on ciphertext, but we can't do it using this particular trick, then uh, what can we do? Well, it turns out that elliptic curves actually have one, they have an additional incredible structure that allows us to sort of emulate this CDH, CDH, easy CDH problem, but only one time. So it only allows us to do one, comp one time CDH. Yeah, and this is, what, this is the beginning of an, a huge area called uh, pairing-based crypto, which unfortunately I think I'm, I'm only gonna be able to uh, outline at a very high level. So I'll just give you the history here. So this, the, the idea of pairing-based crypto actually dates back all the way to Andre Ve, we've already seen Ve's work yeah, uh, earlier in the lecture. Uh, dates back to 1949. This is, by the way, when you, um, so as part of his work on bounding the number of points on curves, he developed this pairing, and that's the thing that's now become so useful in crypto. I have to tell you a story here in that uh, Andre Ve wrote a, a beautiful uh, autobiography of his, of his life. Reading that autobiography basically shows you, you know, the chaos that happened in Europe during World War II and how it affected mathematicians. It's actually quite a nice book to read. In it, he says, at some point during the war, he actually spent some time in jail, because he was a conscientious objector. And he says that his time in jail was basically the most productive time of his life. This work he did while he was in jail, apparently they were required to give him paper and pencil, and that's all he needed, to the point where he was gonna write a letter to the head of the French Mathematics Academy saying that every mathematician should be required to spend some time in jail <laughs> um, so they can be as, as productive. Yeah, so take that as, as advice, as career advice, but not seriously. <laughs> okay, so what did he do? Well, basically, he came, he came up with a pairing. What is a pairing? A pairing is something that takes two points on the curve and maps them somewhere else. And this pairing has this amazing property that if you apply them to, you know, p times an integer and q times an integer, the integers tend to multiply. So in effect, what this does is kind of gives us a one-time CDH algorithm but not really. What it does is it does a one-time CDH, but it moves us to some other structure. It moves us, we, we're not left on the curve anymore, we kind of move somewhere else. Okay, so it allows us to do one computation, one product of these U's and V's, but as a result, we have to move somewhere else. Turns out this pairing is efficiently computable. This was due to Victor Miller, and that actually, this tool was an enormous gift to crypto. It's extremely, extremely effective. I was gonna show you one application, but I think I'll skip it. And I'll just tell you that there are an enormous number of applications to this tool. Again, you're going to have the slides so you can look at uh, the set of applications. It's, uh, at this point, there are literally thousands of papers uh, written on using this tool. Um, so very, very productive use of pairings. And so just to conclude my talk, I'd like to say that, I'd like to kind of just survey a little bit of what's happening in crypto these days. It's, again, a, an enormously active field. It's a very, very good time to be working in crypto. Lots and lots of open problems, lots of, of progress on problems that have been open for many years. And so, as I said, one problem that um, is actively being worked on is debated is basically, how do we choose curves? How do we choose a curve such that we're all comfortable in that the problem, the CDH problem, is hard on the curve? Another amazing development that's happened in, in recent years 
due to Garg, uh, Gentry, and Halevi, Sanjam Garg is right here. You can say hi. Sanjam uh, really has moved the field forward, is going beyond pairings, beyond pairing-based crypto, going to something called multilinear maps. If you remember, I told you that pairing-based crypto gives you one time CDH. Multilinear maps, in some sense, give you a K time CDH. You not only do you do it once, you can do the C you can solve the CDH problem K times and exactly K times. This was a major open problem for many years, and uh, Garg, Gentry, and Halevi were actually the first to give uh, a, a fantastic solution to this problem. Uh, really, really quite remarkable work. That turned out to have enormous applications in crypto. The most surprising application, one that took me by complete surprise, is um, something called code obfuscation, which is basically hide, how to hide secrets in software. So I have a secret key that I want to hide in, in software. I can give you the software, and you'll never be able to extract the key from the code. It's quite remarkable that this is possible. And it, again, it, it, it all ba is based on these multilinear maps. Um, so you can kind of see the progression of ideas from curves to pairing on curves to multilinear maps, which then later on uh, give this wonderful, wonderful way of hiding keys in software. Now, I should say, don't go and you know, start your startup on this idea right away. This is still um, you know, in, in, the, in the early stages of being developed, but things only improve over time. So I would imagine that over time, we're actually going to have much, much more practical and, uh, and, and, and secure ways of doing this. And finally, I'll tell you the third area that's very active in the world of crypto is basically defense against quantum computers. So in my mind, this is an imminent attack on everything that, that, that we have in crypto. Um, quantum cryptography, of course, is something that's being heavily worked on uh, at Berkeley. Um, the physics is sound, basically building, sorry, quantum, crypt, quantum computing is something that's heavily worked on here. The physics is sound, we just have an engineering problem for building these things. Engineering problems tend to be solved, tend to get solved over time. So I would expect at some point to see quantum computers. Quantum computers pretty much destroy all the crypto that's deployed out there today. Yes, so if they're developed tomorrow, we have a problem. Yes, and so now is the time for the crypto community to start developing defenses against these quantum computers. And there's actually quite a bit of work in building quantum resistance crypto so that even if you have a quantum computer, the crypto system remains secure. So even if our friend Nancy develops a quantum computer, the crypto will still be secure. Deploying it is a different matter, but at least we're working on, on those kind of solutions. OK, so if you want to get involved in the world of crypto, I'll mention that uh, there's a, a fun conference called Real World Crypto that we're running um, in January, January 2016. Uh, just If you search for Real World Crypto, you'll find it very quickly. Uh, if you want to learn more about crypto, I'll just very briefly mention um, there's a public online course that I run, it's called, it's called a MOOC. Uh, I wrote down the URL for that. It's free, everybody's welcome to, to sign up. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot more detail than what I was able to do today. So thank you very much. I was really happy to come and give this talk. And I will stop here. <laughs>